Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Uh, what, what have you been up to this week? Um, fairly busy with work. Um, but the weather's been pretty nice. Good. Yeah. I've been getting, getting outside every day. Um, yeah, nothing too exciting. Some time away from the screens. Yeah. Oh, wow. I feel like, I feel like the balance, <laughs> my balance in life is I need to have my focus blocks. I need to have my time away from screens and I need movements and like positive social interaction of some kind. <laughs> it's like if those pillars aren't in place, then let's get out of way. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Well. So Jesse, do you have any updates? Um short versions is it's it's we robot week. Oh really? So that this coming week you mean? Yes. There's a workshop Thursday. And I think the main event's Friday, Saturday. Oh wow. Okay. So I don't I don't have anything finished to show us yet, but um I wouldn't mind potential feedback. On some of it, like Sunday or earlier in the week, perhaps. Yeah, please. Oh, sorry, was that? Please pass the or like send out a you know something for comments in the Slack when you're ready. So, um, it should be good. It should be. Um, sorry, I'm trying to get the Notion page up here. Okay. Uh, we're at 39. Uh, yeah, I'm actually looking forward to it quite a bit. Um, even if I'm, I'm unsure if the other posts I'm working with will be a thing for the event because it's been kind of a slow summer with the other group that I'm, I'm working with. But like it doesn't, it, either way, it'll be great to be there. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Um, I, um, I'll put this in. I have to check, I have to adjust the dates because for the reason the dates don't show right on um, the, the page if we want to take notes today. Um, in, in the chat. Uh, it, it should be fun. Um, outside of that, uh, I'm really motivated. Like, it's been a good week for me in terms of kind of getting back on the groove of things. Um, I, I'm coming off of an injury that affected my mobility. And I'm glad that it's recovering because it's, I, I said to a friend of mine last night that compared to uh, like last Sunday, last Saturday, and, and now um, is really, really nice comparison because um, I just feel so much more in line with a bunch of things like sort of having my academic ambition and goals and, and I feel like it's been really nice. Cognition Futures has been an amazing thing. And I, I know I, I thank people about that often, but just like the community being able to look at stuff and the consistency of it that's, that's lasted. Um, like I said, it's Friday and I don't know. I, I, I don't know if we'll be talking more about that or I think Rochelle has said she's going to present today. Yeah. Um, but like we said, Friday, um, in my sort of, um, I don't know, story time, like, like professional development story time, uh, it's, it's been, uh, such a critical, um, vantage point. Like, I feel like I wish that that which I've gained from my few years in the lab, just in terms of perspective of research and ideas and how to do 
how things move forward or not, and the context to ask a lot of the questions and explore things in a way that's really open. Um, I really feel like that's uh, not, I haven't had a lot of environments that supported that kind of understanding. And yet I feel like that's something we really, I really want to, like, as, as I go through my, I don't know if I can call it a career, but my academic or para-academic project life or whatever it is, um, I feel like it's really important, not just because it's frontier map or anything else. I, like, I think it's genuinely valuable, and, and a lot of people don't, um, you know, it's it's a difficult when you're dealing with interdisciplinary stuff when you're dealing with things that deal with humans it, as a as a whole human object dealing with the human messiness whether it's psychology or to an extent even like brain computer interface which is more technical but still dealing with those models oh oh this this is perfect I'm glad I remember this I saw this I saw this um, kind of simplistic you know, internet post where this guy was like, oh, I'm a serious philosopher. They're, they're, a, they're a, a newer person um, in, in the arena, but they were just like presented as a very hardcore philosophy person when, and kind of having their, their motif about it and saying, well, it's very, very, it's just like classic sensational kind of clickbait thing. Really, like, is is the time of philosophy over? You know, and soon, soon we're very soon at the point where all synaptic activity will be modeled perfectly by computers, and we can like like a complete absconding of philosophy for like neurobioreductionism, and at the level like it's it's like it's already here, but like saying we're already there, it's, it's happening, and I'm just like, well. <laughs> It's, you know, it, it's, a, it's a meme social media account, and I don't hold it to more than that. But it's kind of funny because it's so much on the edge of, boy, like, you stare out into this landscape of how are we going to make progress on the theories and the methodologies together? Because even, even in isolation, one of them is, is kind of rough. And then pairing them, and, like, I keep reversing the brain dance and just how far we are away from that. You know, that's, it's, it's, it's always interesting that way. So I guess my conclusion is I feel, and this is kind of why I made Joe Pro. And, and I, I think I'm kind of returning to, I've got to have that conversation. Like it's important for me to have the conversation about how do we walk people through this, this sense? Because, you know, people are doing, uh, I talked to a sociologist person. I talked to a philosophy, history, science person recently. I talked to about people that are butting up against the different sort of macro and micro theories of all this stuff. And, and it's, you know, how do you find your space in, in those changing tides um, and changing, you know, uh, roles? And like we said yesterday about like, the conversation about finding your niche in that process. Um, and it's a little bit different if you're doing specifically technical stuff or just developing software, sure. But the more you're pushing things forward, the, the different, the pace and, and the focus is different. Or as Norbert, Norbert Wiener might have said in, in his book, you know, the devil you're dealing with is different. Like the game you're playing is different. And what what kind of stakes and, and how you have strategy that's acceptable when you're trying to solve certain problems and, and stuff is different. So that's been in my mind quite a lot this week. Um, I, to step back from that and say other things, I would say uh, I've been writing a bit more consistently, which is also good. I, I, um, I, I mentioned sort of the philosophy history of science project and I'm not, I haven't really done much with that yet. Um, I'm not sure if that's going to become like a discussion group or something, but I really would like it to be. I'm, I'm kind of starting to talk to 
the person I mentioned collaborating with that before uh, again. And um, my, my latest sort of like new thing, um, I'm trying to think how I can best represent this. Um, I'll, uh, yeah, one second. And I'll, I'll share my screen very briefly to show something. The latest sort of new, new thing for me, which I, I would introduce separately, but it's really just going to be like two sentences for me to say here, really. Um, <coughs> is going to be this. Um, so this is, uh, this is about, this is the last part of Michael Levin's um, page, like research page, not the blog, but his research lab page. And this is sort of, like, this is what makes me really excited to see, like, what's what's his blog going to be about? Because we've, we've, we've been anticipating that for a while. And it's, it's tough because I feel like I'm actually in, I realize that I have, um, I realize I have a, a relative privilege to Dr. Levin because I can write stuff in a very exploratory way and not I have a lot more freedom than him because if he if he writes something that's speculative, you know, and people take it a certain way, then it's like, you know, it's harder. Uh, and I realize that. So I'm curious how that will go, but this is the last part of his research like research kind of inspiration research background page and i won't read all of it but um I, I really like the end of it which is let's i just want to go through this last sentence which is one two three four plus lines um but i think it's really something all of this work is being synthesized towards a framework for understanding and relating to, with some cybernetics uh, dog whistles, whether by communication or control, truly diverse intelligences, a project that has implications not only for evolutionary biology and someday perhaps exobiology, as in biology, past, present, future, and you know, other planets perhaps, outside of the bounds of what we know now anyway, but also for development of ethical and social frameworks that will become essential in the future as forms of agents around us diversify far between what is currently imaginable. And I think I think there's something between that, something between what we've talked about in terms of, oh, like the modern day Norbert Weiner quote, um, where I've said um, Norbert would be really, really, really particularly aware of the different like perceptual embodiments that people have. And even if it's just, if, like, he mostly, like the human use of human beings talk specifically about um, the vantage point of information that is available, right? And you know, his sort of homeostatic or anti-homeostatic comments about you know, how, how things emerge or don't emerge in, in society and in communication. But between let the, between the between this, between what I just said about Norbert and then my own sentiment here of like, I keep coming back to the last sentence because to me there's there's a retrospective impact on these understandings that highlights the lacking of previous ethical frameworks and systems as well. Uh, and just sort of this sort of frontier mapish comment that it's easier to see these granular disparity, the more total alternatives, it's kind of a, a Norbert phrase for me. And I think I used the right one, but the diachronic landscape that can be referenced, which is from our last paper. Yeah. <laughs> but my point is like, I'm trying to say, one of the most interesting things about this Levin comment, particularly the last sentence, is that he's talking about the future, but I also am saying, I think part of this 
And part of, frankly, you know, 2023 and a lot of things that we're dealing with is that we're only getting able to see um, certain insights now because we have the means to see them and we can look back and see that they were there, but it we can't do anything about them. So that's why I say we, we can't retroactively go back, but we can start to do some of the archaeological undigging of how things came to be. And I think Levin's point is one that's not really well embraced by a lot of people caring about a lot of the futurist talk doesn't really seem to get this, which I, which is why I really like it is that the way um, the forms and the agents develop and the diversity that is happening or going to happen based off of all the stuff that's happening here um, is going to require, it, it will break a lot of things. And I think that's, I think for someone like, I don't, I don't, I don't really know any any of Levin's work on ethics, you know. And I'm not saying that's he has to do that or we have to do that following him. But I feel like, yeah, like there's there's a link to it. I posted it somewhere. Um, let's try this. Oops. Not to be in love in fanboy mode too much, but um, I'll conclude with this, which is from one of the other. This is the talk that Amanda posted in this, in I think cybernetics or something. But he started this talk um, about physics to mind, talking about all the way back Turing and his investigations and looking both at like computation but also chemical morphogenesis and form. And if we, well, I guess it's right here, conveniently, but like uh, the title of the session is Beyond Growth and Form, um, Morphogenesis is a Gateway to Diverse Intelligence. So I, I think there's, there's important things here and um, a future, future, future direction of interest for me is, is kind of a synthesis of all of these spaces wherein um, I think, I think there's, I think, I don't know. I'll just say that the, the, the closing sentence, I think, is a, a very fitting thing by which to understand a lot of the efforts that are, um, you know, there's a, re I, I think there's, I think there's a very meaningful, there's a lot of meaning to me that this is the, the last sentence and the last point in all these other things that are happening on this page are more beginner systems, the dynamic information, um, and so on. All the quotes and images here, like I actually really, I see this to be an important page. So I'll leave it at that um, and leave that to be my sort of opening update for thoughts on my mind um, today. So what would you, you said that it was like a, some sort of new thing that, is it like a new thing you're fascinated by or is that like the prelude to a project or, or you know, even talking about diverse intelligences, but uh, what are you thinking in terms of going further on that? Yeah, so, well, since you asked, um, um I would like to pursue a project. And maybe this is something to think about for next year. Um, because it's, it's not quite the methods project. Well, it's, it's not the methods project. And it's not quite the philosophy of history project. It doesn't really fall into anything we've done so far. It's, it's maybe, it's, some, it's a mixture between Maybe, and I don't know because I don't I remember the details. It, it's kind of a mixture between perhaps some of the cultural evolutionary stuff we've talked about before. Um, 
some 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 un, indeterminate form of the society ethics tech and I really want to find a way to find the papers by Inez Hippolito or just talk to her because the way she, in some of her podcasts, she's talked, she's talked about basically the, the same thing from her angle of how phenomenological investigations and the view of I forget what I forget what she was talking about. I think it was the term embodiment. But phenomenology and embodiment together have this sort of doing good research in that space. I don't want to say eats away from, but offers challenge to many of the paradigms and norms or or at least the lack of questioning of of what those spaces might be in a similar way it's sort of like the opposite and it's sort of like a, the other side of the coin to what levin said in the last statement so i guess i guess what what um to to be more concrete and less background generating. What I would like to do in the future is really immerse myself in. Like I will, if I could just if I could just do it, you know, like do what I want to do. I would say, okay, Inez, okay, Michael Levin, okay, uh, talk to me about what what you're seeing here. And how do we push that forward a bit? Um, and and it's it's tough because I want to bring other people into that too. It's not just those two people, but like the nature. Like I would like to really, I would like to make some research paper project artifact that really clearly emphasizes the point that I see both of them trying to make in their different ways, even if one's more inside out and one's more bottom up, top down, or biologically, you know, biologically focused. I think it's the same thing. And I would like to just bring those thoughts closer together in terms of a, a making a thing. Do I think, I, I don't, I don't think, and part of why I really like the phrasing of that page Levin's research page is that I think there's a reason that it's the last sentence and not a heading for all of the work. And some of that's because of you know I don't think I don't think he's he would get he's going to get funded for that outright and the visions he has and, and the nature of what he's doing is pilot you got to be the bio guy you know and that's fine but also I think. I think there is a, a perhaps even deeper thing for me that I would am definitely going to aspire towards in, in the long term is there's a connection between the theory work and the technological means by which something can be justified quote unquote with science. I don't really want to say empirically, but but um <clears throat> I don't know. I I guess I guess I'm saying I guess to to to, to I'll I'm gonna digress and or just step back and, and say what I would like to do in the future is flesh out an artifact that brings the points together from what Levin's last last remark is and in this ability is about phenomenology or embodiment is and say, what is this what is this getting at? Is there something there? And I'd like it to be elaborated upon. A deeper, deeper, a deeper cut than that in a longer term thing is that I think a lot of important work in this in these spaces is not something that is going to be focused on, oh, we are doing ethics research and here's our ethics research result. No, you're doing research in a space but I think 
modeling and talking about in a way that's very obviously realizing, hey, what we're dealing with is going to affect these frameworks um, in the way that Levin said, it's like, oh, well, yeah, like as, as, as the forms and diversity becomes more and more apparent, it will have a direct relationship in realizing that, oh, what we thought of as marginal, so we've been this conversation many times before, and I think Amanda said it well, something like, it's things that are marginal or, or on, the, on the far fringes maybe actually aren't as marginal as they seem, and I'm not just saying that out of a general progressive uh, uh, politeness and inclusivity. I'm saying it out of a sense of, yeah, the models are wrong. And <laughs> and just because of what has, we, have, uh, we haven't had the means by which to really have the articulation we need to have. So it's, it's an ethical impact but the research and the work and getting getting the data and the stuff is is actually just doing having the means to do i don't want to say better science as if science is the answer but having the means to do actually better science and information uh improving the under deepening the actual understanding and I think there's very specific reasons as to why that hasn't been able to happen. That I think some of the research that Levin's getting into is, you know, um, important. The end. <laughs> well, that was good. Um, yeah, I had things to follow up on there. Um, yeah, so your timeline for that is next year, I guess. Well, I mean, it's it. I feel like I'm I'm already booked through no, the end of November. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Not to sound like I'm some you know uh, 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 um, you know pop music act that that everybody's in demand of right now, but more like I don't, I just don't see it happening anytime sooner than that. Um, and it's not. It's not like I have it demarcated. It's just it's 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 slowly percolating on, on the back burner. Yeah. So yeah, we'll see. Well, good Do you have the, yeah. the timing or? Whatever? Well, I mean, I think like you could start it kind of, you know, uh, whenever you want. I think probably it would take a while to formulate some like what's your sort of contribution to that area. So like, is it just synthesis? Is it like kind of coming up with something new or are you inspired by it or I, I take it it's kind of like cognition futures where it's like you're taking all this stuff and trying to synthesize it and trying to figure out the forward and backward trajectories of it as it were and it, so yeah it depends on like there's a version of it that it depends on how much I think the factors of what it becomes are do I get to have direct communication with Inez and or Levin about it? Because I think that would getting getting to talk, getting to really talk to them may affect some of what I try to do. Because if I don't get direct contact with that, um, I feel like that inherent as in, in the cognition futures paper pyramid sense, I feel like I'm inherently starting at the low information gap, like the gathering stage. Like I don't think you can get around that. Um, so maybe the first step would be some kind of a, you know, literature review survey type paper, classic thing. But I, I feel like, you know, um, and some, in terms of making an artifact, maybe that's all it would be, but I feel like having a really articulated I would love to have a almost like a um, not a banner, but a kind of really articulated. It's essential. I think there's a version of it where it's almost like a highly articulated uh, vision statement for future research directions or lab directions, in that 
like it's almost like making I don't want to say free energy principle. It was like it's a principle in that like a guiding a guiding principle, not on which Starfleet is based, but um uh like are you doing things that are acknowledging the, the implications of this you know uh and I don't, I don't really know what to make of it from that end but but it's sort of like there's there's some kind of an applied variant of of what i'm doing um but at the same time i think i think the core the core message on that i that i like about levin's thing and i'm curious if he actually says this in, in his forthcoming blog post to an extent is I think a lot of it really is just doing the work to expand the models. Like it's not, there's these, there's these sort of inherent implications, but you can't really do anything about them other than bring, bring the prerequisite work into existence. So I feel like for myself, I'd like to really just dive deeply into that and come away with something. I don't know if it's going to be like, I'm not going to make a, a separate lab group about, yeah, let's, uh, you know, ethical implications of diverse intelligences. I, I don't think I'm going to do that. Um, but. That sounds like would, actually something that would be very, uh, that, that sounds like something very concrete, just to let you know. Like, something what? Something okay. very concrete. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, but I get your point, yeah. Um, yeah, so that's great. Uh, thanks for the update and that sort of preview of things. Uh, we, we, you know, we, maybe we should give it some more thought as to what other people in the lab, if, if they're interested or, you know, sometimes you can put out feelers for things. Amanda? Yeah. And I'm, yeah. Um, I, was, I think some of this could um, be a part of a discussion after we finish the Weiner book. Um, I definitely think some of Levin's stuff is related just to like specific things that, um, that come up in the book. Um, and that I just think that could be a, a natural next step of, of that reading group. Um, not that it could, you know, check all of the boxes for this project, but we could like pick some supplementary readings with, with these thoughts in mind. I'm for that. Um, yeah, yeah, that's good. It's something that I don't, you know, I don't have a clear project structure yet in mind for it. It's just, it keeps, it it keeps, like I said, it, like I said in the post, it keeps coming up for me and it's something that I feel like I'm eventually going to have to do something with it. Um, right. Yeah. Anyway, like we can, how, how are you, Bradley? I don't know. You got anything? Oh yeah, well I'm doing fine. Uh, we didn't have a devorm this week, but we did have a cognition futures and a uh, open source meeting, so those went pretty well. Uh, otherwise, yeah, I mean I'm doing all right myself. Nice. Yeah. Uh, so let's let me see. I don't think there's much in the Slack. I was going to do a Slack review, but I'm not sure if we have anything that new in in the Slack. Uh, I might want to go over, well, actually, congratulations to Jesse. He's been doing some writing on our medium. Uh, let's see. Let me share my screen here. So he's been doing some writing on the medium. He posted this update. This is the update that we talked about in the meeting a couple times where we had, uh, uh, the first nine months, it was like the first six months, and then it was delayed to nine months. But this this is a nice overview. This is kind of like analogous to what I did in the video last year on the Open House channel. So in the Open House channel, we have videos from last year uh, talking about, uh, you know, updates for the year. And every time you go through the year's activities, you always forget a lot of things. So you have to go back and you have to kind of, uh, you know, go look at what you did you know you have to make a record of what you did first that's always good but you always have to think about things and, and put them out and i think this exercise of putting things out in order or at least you know sorting them into different categories 
different projects is a really good exercise for just recognizing what you've done over the past year. So we've done a lot of stuff this year. Uh, we, we have some major lab themes that we're working on uh, continually. Uh, we've been to a couple of events, uh, Embodied Intelligence, uh, NICWIC, uh, Hyperdigital Designs, Google Summer of Code, which is, of course, a program we uh, participate in, and then some other kinds of things that are coming, uh, you know, uh, coming soon. So that, that's great. Uh, yeah, I'm glad you put this together, Jesse. It looks good. Um, and then, you know, closing out the year, we'll be doing some of these other things that we're talking about now. So yeah, it's good. Thank you for that post. And I know you've also post, you've also um, prepared a post on some phenomenology related stuff. And I hope to review that this weekend. I want to space them out so that they're not like I don't post one thing today and then another thing tomorrow and people don't read one or the other. It's not a particularly time bound thing, so there's really no pressure about okay. it. Um, even even the quote the nine month review, um, probably should have finished that up a few a month or so ago to go. But it, it's out there and it's nice to just to have the thing. We should I it's not really a top five of my priority list, but I would I wouldn't mind putting it into that nicer format that um I think on kit uh, put the like almost like a formal report, you know, theme. So that would be nice to do. Uh, yeah, I I do the can. This is the Canva template that he introduced uh, several weeks ago. So yeah, we should put that in there. Is it one that we can just access, or do we have to like have them do it? I, I, uh, I, I think I got permissions for it, so I might okay. just do it. I might put it in the template. I don't know how it should look, but. You know, it's probably not that difficult. Um, okay, I, I mean, I if we have access to it, I'll look at it too. Or if you if you start it, let me know. I don't I don't know. If, yeah, yeah. I'll, 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 I'll have it looked at, like if we can share work on that or not. But yeah, I, don't I, know. I will help out with it. I don't know. He has the permission set up, but I'll check. Um, yeah, so that's great. Welcome, Morgan. How are you? All right. Uh, yeah, so that's that's our medium. And then um, let me go to some of the things that we've been kind of collecting, have papers. So yeah, I've got a lot of different types of paper that I can go over. Um, this is a, a couple of papers that have come out on continual learning recently, especially one on uh, continual learning and art augmented intelligence. So let's take a look at these. Um, this is a new paper from in biological cybernetics. Uh, it was published in the last few months. Uh, this is bio-inspired task-free continual learning through activity regularization. So people are approaching this from different angles. Um, and so I don't, I'm not familiar with these authors. But um, so let's go over this one first and then talk about augmented intelligence and see what they have to say about that. So the abstract reads, the ability to sequentially learn multiple tasks without forgetting is a key skill of biological brains, whereas it represents a major challenge of the field of deep learning. So this is where, you know, we have deep learning algorithms and they tend to do, they tend to forget things where they have this catastrophic forgetting where they lose all their intelligence. Um, and so, you know, one of the hallmarks of biological brains is that we have these memory mechanisms. And so, or we have the ability to put multiple tasks together and have task uh, transfer training and things like that. So those are things that we really haven't been able to replicate in um, deep learning. To avoid catastrophic forgetting, various continual learning approaches that they, they abbreviate CL have been devised. However, these usually require discrete task boundaries. So that means that you have to define the task very precisely and the boundary of the task very precisely in order to get anywhere with that. So, like, you know, you think about like a traditional psychology experiment, we typically investigate uh, tasks as very specific things. Like you'll have an end back task 
or you'll have a Tower of Hanoi task where you have, uh, you know, you have to do something in a certain amount of time. You don't have any, you know, distractions in the environment. The task is separated in time. We've talked about these things before. And that's, you know, that's not what the real world is like. If you go into the real world, of course, it's very different. And for a psychology experiment, it's actually kind of a good thing because you can remove the confounding variables. Like, you know, you think if I just put someone in the real world and I looked at how they behaved, you'd get this sort of insight about how they behave, but you wouldn't be able to measure it statistically or get some handle on, you know, what the task itself, the challenges posed by the task itself. Whereas in, you know, if you want to do something like train a robot to do something in the real world, you have the opposite problem. You know, you have a, an environment that's too abstract away from like real life, I guess. And so you can use continual learning to sort of get around this. Um, and so in the real world, tasks are not always so well defined. You know, you do things sometimes like you know, you encounter tasks like walking upstairs with a bunch of coffees where you kind of have to navigate a crowd or things like that. And so those are sort of improvisational, but they're also overlapping with other tasks and cognitive functions. Here we take inspiration from neuroscience where sparse non-overlapping neuronal representations have been suggested to prevent catastrophic forgetting. So we have these... Uh, you know, sparse and non-overlapping neuronal representations, they don't overlap and interfere with one another. They're kind of stored uh, separately and then accessed. As in the brain, we argue that these sparse representations should be chosen on the basis of feed-forward, which is stimulus-specific, as well as top-down, context-specific information. So we've talked about bottom-up and top-down, but in this, or at least in this case, they say feed-forward and top-down which is a little bit different. Um, so feed forward is stimulus specific. That means when you have some stimulus coming in, it's feed forward into the brain or into the uh, you know network. And then top down being context specific, meaning that you have context on top, you know, it's kind of being imposed upon the task. And so that's what they mean by that. To implement such selective sparsity, we use a bioplausible form of hierarchical credit assignment. We've talked about credit assignment, known as deep feedback control, and combine it with a winner-take-all sparsity mechanism. So they're using this uh, these two methods. In addition to sparsity, we introduce lateral recurrent connections within each layer to further protect previously ruined representations. So basically, they're using feedback uh, selectively to protect, you know, once you learn a representation, you don't want to lose it. Uh, you have this sort of thing called representational drift, which happens when you have a representation and it drifts away from the original, and we want to avoid that as well. We evaluate the new sparse recurrent version of DFC on the split MNIST computer vision benchmark. And split MNIST, MNIST is, of course, the uh, digits and letters that, you know, are presented in a machine learning context, and then you have to, the machine has to recognize the correct uh, letter or number based on the pattern on the screen. So sometimes the numbers and letters are uh, shaped differently in different fonts or in different styles, and the computer vision system has to recognize it correctly. So that's a, that, that's usually used as a benchmark uh, for a lot of tasks, but in this case, they're using a split MNIST paradigm. So they, they uh, evaluate this new sparse recurrent version of DFC and show that only the combination of sparsity and intralayer recurrent connections improves uh, CL performance with respect to standard backpropagation. So standard backpropagation is sort of like this feedback, and then this is a different way of doing it. Our method achieves similar performance to well-known CL methods such as elastic weight consolidation, and synaptic intelligence without requiring information about tasks boundaries. Overall, we showcase the idea of adopting computational principles from, from the brain to derive new task-free learning algorithms for uh, continual learning. So they have this 
um, you know, they, they can review the different methods for continual learning that people have developed, at least in terms of uh, deep learning. So uh, their focus is on multi-layer artificial neural networks, which of course are deep learning networks, but you can, you know, there are other examples of that, like just regular neural networks and, and things like that. A range of continual learning approaches has been devised that includes modifications of the network architecture, loss function, or the implicit, implicit explicit storage of previous task data. So there are a lot of ways to sort of get around um, catastrophic learning and try to enforce continual learning. Um, to address the continual learning problem, brain-inspired approaches have been developed. For example, French point, pointed out that the problem of catastrophic forgetting might not be intrinsic to biological neural networks, but is rather an effect of distributed and overlapping task representations that emerge when using the standard backpropagation algorithm. So this is something that in, you know, you don't, it like, if you simulate uh, something that you think is producing a behavior like a biological neural network, you might be uh, tempted to, or led to the conclusion that catastrophic forgetting is intrinsic to biological neural networks. But they actually seem to be rather robust to the sort of catastrophic forgetting. It's actually maybe more of an effect of your artificial network. And in that case, it's these distributed and overlapping task representations that emerge uh, as a result of using backpropagation. So in line with this idea, it has been suggested that biological networks might avoid catastrophic forgetting by representing information through a sparse but task-specific subset of neurons and synapses to which learning is restricted. So, you know, in biological networks, there are these small pathways, smaller subset of pathways that you use for different things. And these are task-specific. So this is uh, something that I think they're trying to replicate here. Other approaches relax the idea of restricting learning to subpopulations and the more general notion of learning with res within restricted subspaces, which is learning within a, uh, uh, you know, finding a subspace to learn in and, and doing that. So this is where they're kind of getting in um, to their methods. Uh, they adopt deep feedback control which is a bioplausible deep learning framework in which every neuron integrates inputs from the previous layer, as well as top-down error feedback during learning. So there's this deep feedback, which is, of course, um, where you have this more immediate feedback from the previous layer, but then also top-down feedback during learning. And so this, you know, it's kind of like this short, short distance and long distance feedback that's combined. And so that's how, you know, you get this sort of I guess more um, nuanced control mechanism. That's the best way to put it, I guess. Um, you know, to enforce sparsity, we combine DFC with a winner-take-all mechanism and restrict learning of the feed-forward weights to active neurons. So this gives them something called sparse recurrent DFC. So they are actually developing this new technique to look at this problem. So. Uh, you know, there are different computational strategies for continual learning. Um, and this is really in the service of trying to overcome catastrophic forgetting. Uh, so there are a lot of different strategies in the literature. There are actually three categories they talk about here. Uh, first are replay methods. So this is where you rely on implicitly or explicitly storing and revisiting previous data while learning new tasks. It's like if you replay a video in your head of like the, uh, you know, experience that you had yesterday, you know, that helps you to remember that in a long-term sense. Uh, there are a lot of theories of long-term memory which suggest that when animals sleep, they consolidate their memories by replaying those memories again and again and they get encoded synaptically. So uh, if we talk about replay methods, these can be accomplished in artificial networks by storing small subsets of previously seen data in a memory buffer or by training a generative model. And you can have this sort of thing. Uh, they didn't consider data replay in this work because they wanted to focus on bioplausible plasticity. They didn't want to have any external data storage. 
but I, I mean, I imagine in biological brains, it's done differently. But this is the way they do it in artificial neural networks. Um, then the regularization methods, which constrain learning to preserve parameters that are important for previous tasks, uh, usually by adding specialized loss terms. So it's like regularizing your experience. Uh, you know, like sometimes you'll see things for just a second, but sometimes other things you'll see for minutes at a time. And the thing you saw for just a second might be uh, very important to the to building and maintaining that memory, but it's not weighted properly. So things are regularized. And so this is, again, is, is uh, implemented by this elastic weight consolidation and synaptic intelligence. So they're two strategies that people use. Um, and then third is our, there are architectural methods that are based on structural changes such as freezing weights or adding and removing neurons. Neurons can also be dynamically beta gated based on context, meaning that they're activated only in a certain context. But context is usually externally provided rather than being a property of the network itself. So we have this top-down context, as we mentioned before. So that the, the the context is imposed in a top-down way. So I have we have some maybe some comments in the chat. Okay, so this is uh, Jesse, and R E the opening line of the abstract, and this is Figshare, Norbert computer versus brain. Uh, this is Norbert Wiener. Oh, the Norbert Wiener quote from yeah, it's, it's like differentiating you know, the functionality and how it affects a lot of things. Um, so it's just running me that. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's an important thing to revisit <laughs> as we as we go through a lot of this work because, you know, this is, was something that they had, you know, had a very fuzzy uh, intuition about and then people were doing, like, all sorts of different techniques. So, um I wonder if the replaying memories, which I've also heard in terms of playing various scenarios about how things could have gone, is sort of related to identifying all the possible possibilities, uh, possible trajectories of action. Um, yes, it is, I guess. Um, I mean, one of the things about replay is that it's, you know, we don't really know the details of how animals replay memories, but, you know, you, you will take certain aspects of the memory that it's more salient or less salient. And what they're doing here is they're saying that, you know, we re they're, what they're implying in this paper is that we replay memories to sort of get the details down or get some of the, the, the sketch of things down. And then those are regularized. So you take things that maybe are very rare and you kind of generalize them and, and there's some things that we do to adjust those they don't just get represented as the the actual replay it's like you know and and some of that is for generalizing to other things some of that is like so you don't forget details but we do actually forget details we have false memories we have other things that you know we can actually observe pretty well that you know although we don't for catastrophically forget things we also misremember things, and so um, that's that's one point. But identifying all possible trajectories of action, yeah, replay does allow you to generalize your memory. So if you replay something, you can think about like diff you know things from different angles or you know different possibilities. Um, I'm not sure it's in, embedded sort of in the same process, but it's you know one of these things where we don't really know how it works. It's possible that you know, if you're encoding a memory, a robust memory is something that you can sort of recall from different angles or contexts. Like, so if I'm walking down the street, I remember that I had this experience before. Or if I'm, you know, uh, playing tennis, uh, I remember, oh yeah, I know how to play tennis. And those memories are kind of accessed from different points in the experience. Mm. Sorry, I was just siren in the background. Uh, yeah, so let me write down a note here. Going to jail. <laughs> um, yeah, I miss. I kind of miss. Um, I think you comment on my last comment about the difference between the the sentiment reinforcement 
I kind of missed that. Oh. I, I think I gathered what you said anyway. Yeah. Whether or not something was a good or bad outcome. Yeah, it's, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, in memories, we know that, like, we encode sort of the emotional valence of it. Like, if it's a bad, particularly bad experience, we maybe try to forget it or we, uh, it's very salient. Whereas if it's a very good experience, it's the same thing. Or if we don't try to, maybe we don't forget it because there's no interference there. But uh, we try to, you know, remember it in a way that's not, that's out of proportion with its importance in our lives. So like, you know, there there, there is a, like a emotional valence in encoding memories as well. And that's something they don't talk about here, but it's something that is nevertheless a thing. Um, that we can take into account. Well, anyways, this, this paper kind of goes through continual learning. In, in, in talking about in the brain, they, they talk about, um, you know, we don't really understand continual learning, which is like this naturalistic interaction with the environment, with the world. Um, we think there are various mechanisms at play. Um, there's this trade-off between fast learning and slow forgetting. This is the stability plasticity dilemma. So stability is where you don't forget things, or forget things very slowly because sometimes things aren't useful to you anymore. But most of the time, when you remember something, it's for a reason. And you know that. So we don't want to have. We want to have a low level of decay for that, but we also don't want to um, forget everything. You know, because we don't want to relearn it. But also, we want to learn things fast. We want to like fear encoding or fear learning is. Basically, if you experience a bad thing one time, you you learn sort of you, you, your fear condition to the point where you can't really interact with certain things normally. You know, like if you get your finger caught in a mouse trap, uh, you could be having a version of mouse traps, and that's that's fast learning, but that's slow forgetting. So you don't forget that experience as well as you'd like to. Um, so that, that's a thing that, you know, we see in neuroscience. To avoid this issue, the interaction between a more plastic system, the hippocampus, and a more stable system, the neocortex, uh, has been suggested as a long-term memory storage mechanism, akin to a data replay strategy, which we mentioned. Um, and so there's, you know, there are other ways that stability and plasticity get, um, you know, uh, managed at the level of individual synapses. There's a mechanism called metaplasticity, which is where synapses that are particularly important for solving previously learned tasks are left unaltered when learning new tasks. Well, less relevant synapses are made available to store new information. Um, and then, of course, we have neurogenesis. We have uh, context, of course, but we have context uh, in the sense of flexible task learning. So, you know, it, it helps us learn different types of tasks and regular, uh, regularize them. Um, yeah, so we're able, this allows us, using context allows us to, it facilitates forward generalization. So if I experience something and then I go forward in time and I experience like things, I can generalize from that previous experience to these new things. And it's easier to learn. And it's more familiar. And of course, it's not always perfect because sometimes you make the wrong decision in forward generalization but still. Um, so yeah, this then they kind of go through a lot of these different uh, factors and they use this to design sort of um, a way forward. So, you know, they have these different ways of learning, the task incremental learning or task IL where the task identity is available during training and at a test time. So the domain IL, the task ID is available during training, but not at test time. And then in class IL, where the task ID is available during training, but at test time, the model must report the task ID alongside solving the task. So there are these ways we can define the task boundaries so we can have like a, a test of, of, you know, some of these things that they're, they suspect are contributing to catastrophic forgetting and building these representations. So this is the paper. I'm not going to go any more into this paper. 
that's one approach to continual learning. That's a bio-inspired approach. They're focusing on task design, but they're also focusing on the bio-inspired aspects of uh, synapses and encoding memories in a network. Now, this uh, paper is uh, from the Cognitive Science Journal, and this is part of their Progress in Puzzles of Cognitive Science Letter Series. So they do actually, in that journal, introduce a bunch of different uh, topics where there's progress made or they're open questions or whatever. And this one is called Cognitive Science of Augmented Intelligence. The Robert Goldstone is an author. He's done a lot of stuff on decision making and other types of things. Marta Galesic and Marina Dubova are also, I think they're uh, ones at the Santa Fe Institute. Uh, so there's a yeah. complexity bent here. It's a, it's a, it's a what bent? I'm sorry. Uh, the complexity. Like they, they're, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's interesting mix of folks because it's, it's got like, thing, things, things we, we could know about the landscape of current research. Indiana. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Indiana, I, I don't know a lot about, but they have, they are one of the, the groups that has like um, a complexity or, or some, there's something specific to them. And I think Riley probably knows what it is. There's a reason. Uh, I think maybe it's they have a particular cognitive science program or something. They or do. develop. I think. Yeah, they uh, do have a formal cognitive science program, like pretty big too. So. Yeah. I, I got them confused with Cincinnati for a little bit, which is oh. where Tony Shamero is. Santa Fe Institute, we know. The Complexity Science Hub, I'm not as familiar with in Vienna, but Vermont Complex Systems Center is Josh Bombard and yeah. that, that crew as well. Just to point all that out as like, know your your groups right now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for that. Yeah, that was good. Uh overview. So these these are they're coming from this kind of perspective. It's both cognitive psychology and complexity. So um, so the abstract uh, reads cognitive science has been traditionally organized around the individual as the basic unit of cognition. So of course we've talked about that in the last paper there were individual agents. So it's not like you're collectively dealing with brains, you're you know having individuals do a task. That task then is tested on a number of individuals, you take an average or a population mean and you say this is the, the outcome. And um, there's variation, but like if you're a cognitive scientist, you generally don't deal with variation. If Sometimes people talk about it as individual differences, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't always register as a thing that's, you know, uh, a thing in and of itself. So despite developments in areas such as communication, human machine interaction, group behavior, and community organization. The individual centric approach heavily dominates both cognitive research and its application. So, you know, we talk about intelligence, we talk about building a, you know, a model of intelligence, and we're usually talking about individuals. And then we assume all individuals are basically similar and that, you know, an individual will interact with an individual and they'll kind of have the same process going on. And then that's, you know, that's it. <laughs> uh, we build the model on the, what's going on in the individual brain, or the mind, I guess. Uh, a promising direction for cognitive science is a study of augmented intelligence, or the way social and technological systems interact with an extended individual cognition. So this is something we talk about in the phasic group. Uh, it's sort of the basis for it, the idea of augmented intelligence. So, you know, Regular intelligence, again, is in the brain and, you know, or, you know, in, in the, we think of it as an internal model. And then, you know, we kind of think about the environment, like things in the environment, like symbols or objects, tools. Those things are sort of there to interact with that internal state. And what augmented intelligence does essentially is it takes those things, those tools and, and, uh, affordances in the environment and, and uses them to sort of leverage an increase in intelligence. So you can augment intelligence. Actually, you can augment intelligence internally um, through different ways as well. You know, there are brain-computer interfaces, for example, where you use 
like a basically a prosthetic device to augment your intelligence in a very similar way to using things in the environment. Uh, so augmented intelligence basically augments the intelligence of an agent or of a, you know maybe a group of people even. So uh, there's a, a famous book by Ashby, W.R. Ashby, who's a cyberneticist. It's called Design for a Brain. And in that book, he has a chapter on an intelligence amplifier and the idea that you can um, amplify intelligence through some sort of closed loop feedback. And so he sketches out this set of boxes and arrows that basically say, you know, there's this measure of intelligence, there's this thing that you intervene with, and then it increases intelligence. So let me go to my board, I'll show you what I mean. So typically we have, you know, in this intelligence amplifier, it's an individual, it's like an individual brain, which is like, again, these boxes and arrows that we deal with. And you have this pathway up to this other thing, which might be prosthetic device it might be the environment we could call it like the uh, amplifier well we don't want to call it the amplifier because I guess it's the amplifier and to not be I mean they were really interested in, in cybernetics in like you know uh, digital stuff so like digital computation sometimes analog audio stuff like you have an amplifier on your stereo or something and this is the individual, this is the brain that we, um, you know, we, we have, we have this, now they use G for intelligence, which is general intelligence, but this is of course just something that they choose as a metric. Um, there are a lot of ways that you couldn't measure intelligence and including in the pet, in the last paper, you know, there are different continual learning approaches you can use for this. But the point is, is that this G is measured in the individual. And then there's this feed forward to the amplifier. And the amplifier amplifies G by a certain factor. And so it could be like 1.4. You know, I don't I don't know. I'm kind of getting a little bit specific here when maybe I shouldn't. But uh, then that amplifier sends a feedback to the individual and it amplifies their intelligence. So what is this amplifier? You know, it could be like, you know, uh, an affordance. You know, it could be like something like a pencil. You could write on a piece of paper. You can then put words out into the world and then read it back to yourself and remind yourself. And that amplifies your intelligence by some factor. And we don't, again, we don't know what that is or means, but it's just the concept, really. Uh, so this is the amplifier. This is the feed, closed loop feedback. So the closed loop feedback here is really kind of the royal road because. It gives us the best sort of, or the most intuitive sort of accounting for this. Um, so we have affordances, prosthetics. We have other types of things, uh, tools. And so the, these sorts of things are, you know, uh, all sort of these amp they serve as amplifiers. And they do this at different rates. So this this amplifier, the gain is set differently for these different things. I just wanted to go over that to give a background as to what they're kind no, of No, I, I appreciate that. Let me um, I'm gonna put that in the notion. All right. Um, Thank you. Yeah, so the, the name of the thing that you're looking for in the literature is W.R. Ashby and Design for a Brain. So let me write it down here. I think he actually also built an agent that was sort of like a, a very simple digital model of this. Where you have, um, you know, it was like a, it was an intelligence amplifier, and I can't remember the details of it, but 
it was like a big box that <laughs> kind of moved in this direction ever so slightly. So, yeah, go ahead. Uh, this is a total side comment. I'll try to make it very brief. It'd be fat like it'd be fascinating. And this is like a, such a me thing to say. So I apologize for being in trouble with myself. It'd be fascinating to have like a really good um like I, I just imagine when 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 like when the book came out. I don't know when when that book came out. Um it was in the late fifties. Yeah, like late 50s. 40s or fifties, yeah. Yeah. It was fifty-two. Okay. okay. So it would just be fascinating for me to see like because the traje- the hype trajectory of oh we're 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 one you know AI hype is is always this in a few years few in a decade we'll have X Y Z right but just like the different the different like waves sort of crashing upon the shore and what 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 the really cool technological insight is and how that instills this wave of hope and then what limits it bubbles up against over and over and over again. It's not always the same one, sometimes it is. But even thinking back to my comment this morning about the guys of, oh yeah, we're, we're like totally, we're, it's already here that we can totally understand all brain activity and it's just going to be computationalized and that's it. We don't even have to think about our thoughts anymore. We're just going to be able to digitize it. And it's like, yeah, there's sort of a hope pessimism the the valence the, the 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 positive or negative side on the valence is is maybe a little either or but it's strong and it's that something's happening and holy crap you know chat GTP is here and everything else but like at the same time there's really hard challenges at play and it's just I feel like that landscape's such an interesting space so we can go back to the paper I'm sorry oh yeah so you know they're they're thinking though in terms of uh, uh, you know, thinking about cognitive science as a study of augmented intelligence or the way social and technological systems interact with and extend individual cognition. So that's why I talked about the design for a brain closed loop feedback. Um, and, and keep in mind that that's a very simple model. So that's an individual model for the individual. It's a very simple model. You hold that in your mind, Reed. Uh, The cognitive science of augmented intelligence holds promise in helping society tackle major real-world challenges that can only be discovered and solved by teams. So now we have not just the individual, but teams. So there's a, you know, there are a lot of people have studied teams for a long time. You know, we consider them as a collection of individuals. Sometimes they take the approach that they're more sort of collective intelligences, whatever that means. Um made by individuals and machines with complementary skills who can productively collaborate with each other. So this is where they take this idea of the individuals and they say, well, you know, every individual has a brain and every individual can have this sort of augmentation. But not every individual is equal in terms of their skills or maybe in terms of their memory is a better way to put it. So we talked about, you know, catastrophic forgetting. We talked about, you know, learning tasks and so what we have here is we have a bunch of individuals and they all have their own feedback, closed loop feedback. They're all interacting with their own instance of like the environment or this amplifier. So this amplifier is amplifying different things and different agents. So I'm doing this backwards, but it doesn't really matter. And so this amplifier is taking things in from the environment in each of these cases. You know, and then the individual is also taking in stuff from the environment. And I would imagine, and this is not something Ashby talked about, that these, these inputs to the amplifier and to the individual have to be evenly matched in order to be like uh, you know, effective. So, you know, if you coordinate the inputs in the amplifier and in the individual you end up with like a good amplification. If the amplifier is amplifying something that's sort of a mask of what the individual is experiencing or it's different, <clears throat> then it, of course it doesn't work very well. So these amplifiers have like, I use A for amplifier. So we have like a couple of different 
amplification context, I guess. And there's an amplification of a certain number. Again, I'm just kind of making these up. This doesn't refer to anything. Um, and then maybe this one is like, this is masked a little bit, so it's not as effective. It actually de-amplifies where it maybe introduces noise. Because that's below one. But the point is, is that you multiply your G by this number and you get an amplification of intelligence. Again, I'm just using this as a, as a thing. I mean, G is kind of a controversial measure. You could have multiple intelligences where you say, you know, and especially in this case where you have different skills. So, you know, you might have emotional intelligence. You might have, uh, you know, technical intelligence. You might have other intelligences. And so that's something uh, Howard Gardner once wrote a book on multiple intelligences. And, you know, people, I don't know how people, what the state of that literature is. But, you know, people are specialized for different, you know, some people are better at certain types of intelligence than others, like emotional or technical or whatever. And so, you know, that's, that's what they would be amplifying in that case. Or maybe they'd be amplifying maybe a general intelligence, but also, or maybe like a general ability to understand and interact with their environment. Like, you know, if you had, uh, you know, a microscope, which would be an affordance to look at, like, things at the micro scale or the nano scale or the, um, you know, those kind of scales where you can't see with the naked eye, that would increase, that would imp amplify your, uh, you know, observational intelligence. So it would be a different thing. It wouldn't be G, it would be observational intelligence. And so it would give you, you know, I mean, we know that, like, uh, you know, scientists before they invented the microscope or people who existed who wondered about, like, cells and things like that. They didn't, like, they weren't stupid. They just didn't have the tools that they needed to amplify their knowledge of that. So that's that's what this is getting at. And so... I think, I think that's basically, like... A very key statement and sentiment for a lot of things here. Yeah. So I guess let me write down with obser observational intelligence, it's technology that amplifies your state of knowledge. That may be actually a little bit easier to quantify than um, some of the stuff that we've been talking about. Is, uh, you know, like um, G, which is an intelligence quotient, is really kind of linked to the population mean and, and to like sort of your knowledge of certain domains and things like that. So it's not it's not particularly easy to like um, get a good measure of amplification there. So I want to just correct some of this. Um, so yeah. So anyways, the point being. The other point I want to make is uh, that these are all sort of closed-loop feedbacks of different individuals. And then you have this network in which they exist. So if you're in a team, you're building a network between each person. And there's there are dependencies in teams. So if we think about like a team that builds open source software, you know, you have maybe a one person who does docs, a documentation another person who does like, you know, uh, maintenance of the repository, another person who works on code, and then another person who works on maybe debugging code. And so they all have different specialties. You know, the maintenance person might be, have really high attention to detail. And so that's an intelligence that you can measure, or at least performance level that you can measure. So it's actually maybe performance level too you can look at as a proxy for intelligence amplification and at that case you're you know in that at that point you're getting uh you know you're getting into learning and uh so yeah you're getting into learning and you're getting into you know not not catastrophically forgetting things and things like that but we you know we have to start somewhere we can start with like maybe measuring performance measuring how that performance is amplified by experience, by learning. So if I'm a 
uh, if I, I maintain an open source repository, I get faster and better at my <coughs> reviews. I, you know, merge commits, I can, I can deal with technical uh, exceptions and things like that. If I'm a coder, I can, you know, write code faster. I can write code more efficiently. Sometimes I might use chat GPT. Sometimes I might not, or, you know, uh, stack overflow as a sort of a cognitive aid as an amplifier. So this amplifier might be stack overflow. And this might be some coder who, you know, gains experience as they do this, but they're also relying on this amplifier to improve their performance. And then this person, you know, writing docs, they have, they're dependent on what these people are doing. So if these people aren't doing their work, then this person, they can't amplify their skills and intelligence because they, you know, or it doesn't become apparent because they can't do anything. So there's some dependencies here. And it's like, you know, in, in a academic field where, Sometimes, you know, it's not that you're dependent on technology, but you're dependent on a state of knowledge. So, you know, if we have a concept that comes along, it's really good at like capturing a lot of things under the one umbrella and it's very effective at predicting things. Then that, that's something that people have access to, their intelligence increases. But it's not really their intelligence, it's just ample, you know, what their their efforts are amplified because there's this better concept. Or it could be a technology. Um, you know, it could be a technology where you get to do things faster. So th this is this is, you know, working in teams. A lot of times in my project management course, I talk about you know teams and how people fit into teams, especially doing stuff like open source. So I'm going to return to the paper and then finish that up, and then we can talk about this more. Um, so. Basically, what they're arguing is that you have this amplification of abilities, intelligence skills, or whatever, however you want to define it. Um, you have this these social and technological systems that interact. They extend individual cognition. Then individual cognition exists in teams. <coughs> so there's this collective aspect that we don't think about uh, usually in cognitive science. We also have this these effects of the team these network effects that can limit cognition. Because if we don't have good communication or good interactions, if their dependencies aren't met, then, then those things, those teams fall apart, but they don't perform at the level that they should. So, yeah, so, uh, you know, cognitive science is changing fast, but it's still anchored in the tradition of studying how people learn and cognize on their own. That's their opening statement. And I don't think that's controversial. Um, but a lot of the cognitive science that exists rarely considers humans interacting with each other and with the technologies they devise. And so there have been a bunch of proposals to suggest moving away from individual-centric cognitive science, so Chatter and Lowenstein, Pickering and Garad, or, uh, Rajaram and Sloman and Furbach. So these are, I guess they're in the, let's go down to the, uh, bibliography to see a couple of these. Uh, Chater and Lowenstein, the I-frame and the S-frame of focusing on the individual level solutions as led behavioral public policy astray. These are behavioral and brain sciences papers, so they have a lot of comments on it. Uh, let's see. Um, I don't know. With, what were the other references here? It looks like some Roger Ram, uh, Collective Memory in the Individual Mind, Trends in Cognitive Science. Uh, let's see. Uh, Sloman and Fernbach, The Knowledge Illusion, Why We Never Think Alone. That's it. So these are all from like the late 2010s, early 2020s. Um, yeah, so there are a lot of interesting papers here in the uh, bibliography. So... This kind of goes through cognitive science of augmented intelligence, why we kind of talked about why that is, uh, you know, that, that making cognitive science about groups is not just a methodological exercise. Like I demonstrated, you can apply this quite well. Um, intelligent yeah. groups often involve dyads, tens, or hundreds of actors, dyads or pairs. And so these are like things you can quantify in terms of groups 
I've, I've done this before. This is something I, you know, I've been interested in the past where you have like, not just individuals, but like these different groups. And, you know, you have these, they're basically social networks. Uh, so, you know, we have like a, basically a social network version of cognitive science. And it's, it's going to be a lot different because you have, you know, not only do you have that many more brains and minds, but you also have variation. And that's the thing that I don't know if they, they don't really talk about here too much, but there's variation between, you know, individuals, not just like, you know, different skill sets, but like, you know, you have different, um, like, you know, if you're doing a task, there's variation, there's cultural variation. There's also, you know, variation in how well, you know, maybe people can see or the things they're exposed to. So you have these differences that you can uh, kind of get at. Um, you could talk about in terms of like optimizing group behaviors or optimizing collective intelligence. So, so that so they're talking about triangulating cognitive systems from multiple vantage points. And by doing that, we can come to a better understanding of their essential nature. And so this is uh, so they kind of this is kind of one of these proposal papers. So they give an outlook. Uh, it's timely. This is a timely issue to talk about. Um, you know, because we have the internet, we have social media, and we have these mass-produced scholarly works that people contribute to, <clears throat> and it's decentralized, and people can get information in different ways. Whereas, you know, traditionally, it's been more top-down. And so thinking about collectives is more important. Also, you know, they don't mention anything about social insects, but social insects have been a, a very a popular model to kind of think about, like, emergent phenomena in terms of the behaviors that are, are come out of it. So social insects are very have uh, very uh, rigid social roles in their colonies. And they can produce a lot of collective structures like nests or, you know, path, uh, road, roadways. Of, uh, like ants will produce a lot of uh, a, a thick network of pheromone trails. Bees will produce hives. Uh, wasps will produce nests. And they're all very uh, complex and they have a lot of uh, uh, sort of regulatory features that allow, you know, for very sophisticated types of air exchange and gas exchange and things like that. So uh, these are all kind of <clears throat> transportation networks. So these are all kind of, you know, analogies. Outside of an analogy, though, you know, it's hard to kind of explain what the connection is between individual minds, individual intelligences, and then these collective structures. People have talked about things like uh, stigmergy, which is where a bunch of individual agents will interact and produce something in the world, like a set of pheromone trails, a communication network, and then that's stored in the world. And then the agent will use that to navigate. So we have those sorts of things in humans, like the internet. Wikipedia is a good example of stigmergy because you have all these stubs that are produced, and those stubs then, uh, you know, people can reference them continually so they don't forget like the stubs in the way that they're related. So it actually serves as that amplifier. Uh, and we can actually measure that in, in you know, in a certain way because it's it's all digital. Uh, we can, you know, you can give them a performance task and we can measure an improvement on it. So this is this is all kind of, uh, they, in this paper, they kind of get into uh, temporal difference learning, uh, reinforcement learning and things. And, and, you know, if you look at this, there's a lot of that in the, in the closed loop feedback. So there's a reinforcement learning in the closed loop feedback. There's a reinforcement learning in amplifying intelligence, like have, do, you know performing a skill, having it amplified by something in the world, and then working on that feedback. It's it's very much reinforcement like. It's very much you know there is a temporal difference learning aspect because you're doing this in time. So there's a lot lot to sort of follow up on here. Um, so any questions about that? No questions, but I definitely want to look at that paper more fully. Yeah, we should, we should think about that more, um, because it's something that's, 
I think it's timely, but it's timely for us because <clears throat> we've and have those assets in our group. We just don't use them as much as we, we maybe should. Um, but that's that's okay. Um, yeah. Okay, so nothing in the chat new. Um, yeah. All right. So I don't know. I don't think Vushali is coming today. So we're already pretty far into the meeting. So why don't we move on? Um, what did Jesse say? Unrelated, um, timely. Yes, not not a big deal. But I had to plug the famous City Pop album because he kept saying timely so much. So. That's it. Okay. In the Cognition Futures group, we talked about we were on this sort of path of talking about micro phenomenology and mm. uh, about different time scales of behavior and of cognition. And then I think it was actually in this meeting we considered, uh, as well as cognition futures, we considered what happens at different time scales. So there are different time scales of cognition. There are these time scales of like, um, you know, behavioral tasks. So it could be 100 milliseconds. You Within 100 milliseconds, you do a behavioral task. You have these uh, ERPs that, that, you know, you can measure their, you know, different aspects of uh, brain activity with respect to a, a cognitive task. And then, you know, you have longer time scales of like five minutes where you have a bunch of those tasks lined up and you might repeat them, you might do them differently, and you have these responses in the brain. And the question is, is there an accumulation of things or do they just happen and go and, you know, they go along and you can measure like a number of ERPs sequentially and then maybe that leads to something else that we have to measure differently. Or maybe they combine and into, you know, a different type of response over time. There are a lot of things with the dynamics there that we don't really, aren't really that familiar with. And if we're doing something like continual learning, this is something we have to focus on because, you know, the question is, is we, we assume that the behavior is going to be constant uh, with respect to a task when we don't know. So we have that sort of window, maybe a like a thousand milliseconds, maybe even shorter, 500 milliseconds. And then we have even shorter intervals than that. So we have things like individual ERPs, which are shorter intervals. They could be 150 milliseconds, 300 milliseconds, 400 milliseconds. And then they're processes shorter than that even, which is to say that there's a response in the brain that gives you these uh, neural responses that we link to behavior. Those really short responses are molecular in synapses. Sometimes those synapse uh, responses are actually longer, like in memory, but they also are very short in terms of how they're activated and their process. So, you know, you could have something like um, a set of, you know, early immediate genes that get expressed when a cell is exposed to a stimulus. And then you could have something that happens at the synapses when a memory has to be encoded. Those things are not easily tied to behavior, but actually in mice, they've done a pretty good job of looking at different proteins involved in the memory, learning and memory consolidation. So I'm going to talk about some things here, um, a couple of papers that have come out uh, that kind of talk about this. So the first one here is, this This is a blog post, actually, Life is Computation. Um, and this is the title of this is a seven minute timer has been discovered in neurons. So this is from February 18th. So this is the seven minute time window. So there are a lot of like discrete behaviors that you can do in seven minutes. You can sit there and do nothing and think about various things for seven minutes. And there's a neural response. We can measure that with fMRI, it's resting state. There's a lot of stuff in resting state. But also seven minutes is a long time cognitively. So, you know, what are we what are we talking about with a seven minute timer? So, you know, one of the questions about neurons is that they fire in response to stimuli, but they also do other things like keep track of time. So you have like, you know, neurons have to do things immediately, but they also have to encode memories over longer periods. They also have to respond they have this prime state of response. So there's there's this adaptation aspect. 
but there's also this thing, and, and I, uh, I remember reading some things on this a long, uh, a while, like maybe a, a, a decade ago, on interval timing, which is where you know the, the brain has its own sort of timing of intervals, especially with respect to task intervals. So you know if there's an interval that you find maybe in music, or maybe in tasks, you try to keep track of that, and there's a mechanism in in the brain for that. But this is a more general question, how the brain keeps track of time. So this question has been intriguing neuroscientists for decades. Circadian clocks, which oscillate every 24 hours, are known to be implemented at the level of molecules and genes. But it's widely believed that keeping track of time for shorter durations, such as seconds and minutes, uh, arise from electrical synaptic activity patterns, not from molecular activity. The idea is that Cells can be connected in ways that result in oscillations or sequential activity. One neuron fires at the one second mark, the next fires at the two second mark, etc. So this statement here about like, uh, you know, that things are implemented at the level of molecules and genes every 24 hours, that's a circadian clock specifically. So these, these divisions are based on the circadian clock. There are other mechanisms where that's not the case. But I think if you think about like, uh, actually, if we think about this as a more general time, um, like a more general um, set of time scales, we could take circadian clocks as an example. So what they're saying is that the circadian clocks, and if you're familiar with what circadian energesi is, circadian clocks are these things that generate um, sort of timing and there's an endogenous clock where you have like these sleep, these wake sleep cycles, or these light dark cycles. And the brain kind of has like a sort of a, something that's encoded. And then it's exposed to the environment where these cycles can vary because we live on a planet that has an axial tilt. And, the, you know, sometimes we get a lot of light, sometimes we don't, during, depending on the season. So the circadian clocks can be entrained to this. So this is a endogenous circadian clock. And this is the environment. And the environment, the, it's like a light source here. And that light source will entrain the circadian clock. It'll basically shorten or lengthen these periods. They call them photoperiods to something that reflects the environment of the organism. If you put someone in an underground bunker for like two months, <coughs> it'll screw up their circadian clock to the extent that they go crazy. But anyways, let's not do that experiment. Let's talk about the different time scales. So what they're arguing is that there are these time scales, and in the article they say, or in the blog post, they say that you have, um, Seconds and minutes, which are the shorter durations, these are elect, uh, governed by sort of electrical and synaptic activity patterns. So this is uh, from seconds to minutes. All right, this is like neural activity, we'll call it, or we'll call it electrical, or electrochemical, I guess would be better. And then maybe for like hours to days, we have these molecular responses and, you know, that set the, there are circuits that set the sort of this endogenous rhythm. And so this is uh, hours to days. All right, so there we have our two time scales, And then in a larger time scale like weeks to months, we entrain this rhythm to our daily activities. So the problem is like with jet lag is that you get this, you misentrain your endogenous rhythm. So, you know, the light source doesn't match what you expect it to. And so these rhythms, you have to re sort of recalibrate those rhythms. And so, um, so it's a calibration 
of the river. So that's that's what our, where our time scales are play. So if you're experiencing this in seconds to minutes, it's largely an electrochemical experience. Uh, then if it's like hours of days, it's some molecular thing. And then if it's weeks to months, it's this calibration, which is behavioral, I guess. So that's what, what we're getting at with the time scales. Um, and then the idea is that cells can be connected in ways that result in oscillations or sequential activity. One neuron fires at the one second mark, the next fires at the two second mark, etc. So with most of our theories of short-term memory, if all the cells in a network go silent for a moment, the timer falls apart. So in other words, that network, um, you know, when we're encoding short-term memory, it's a network of neurons, and they'll have to be active in these intervals to, uh, you know, fire and, and maintain the network. It's interesting that this holds true for genetic regulatory networks, too. That a lot of times they have to be active at a certain time, at time intervals, and if the time interval gets stretched out too far, like in the case of um, of um, cell division, it can you know become non-functional. It can basically change the function of the, the circuit. So a bunch of genes that are regulated at different times, you have to have uh, like a transcript of one gene to have another gene be triggered for expression, and if the time window is too long or if it's not that amount of transcript isn't there then that can interfere with the process so we have these networks that um, you know um, that result in a process that drives us time these time scales forward so you'll have some sort of network of elements in this case we're talking about neurons <clears throat> and they have to be there in a certain order and Operated at a certain time scale. So this could be one second, two seconds, three seconds, and so forth. So, you know, this is something that we can actually look at. Um, and then that's so that's the sort of the traditional model. A recent study, however, has made a serious crack in this paradigm. In a series of two papers from the Crickmore Lab at Harvard. One published last year, which was in 2020, and another last month in 2021. Thornquist and colleagues show that a single neuron can keep track of time in a completely silent manner. So that means that this, it, these neurons can be decoupled from this network, and they can keep time. So it's not dependent on their connections. And notice I put the connections here. There are a lot of sort of uh, non-transitory connections here. So that's that's beside the point but they can operate independently and still keep time so thinking was that you needed connectivity to maintain time and if that was disrupted then it would the network would fall apart but that's actually not true single neurons can keep track of time in a completely silent manner the time interval they studied was a seven minute period in mating fruit flies i believe this is a landmark study that every neuroscientist should know about so here's my attempt to explain it in simple terms so fruit, fly, fruit flies make for a very stereotype 20-minute duration. And the male ejaculates at the seven-minute marker. Okay, so this is like a, a stereotype behavior. A lot of animals exhibit stereotype behaviors. Uh, and they're, so, you know, you can look at these kind of behaviors and get a sense of the, of the timing. Before ejaculation, the male fly is so motivated to continue that it will even risk death to continue mating. After ejaculation, it is easier to get a male fly to let go of the female using heat or noxious stimuli. So the seven-minute timer not only initiates specific behavior, such as ejaculation, but also controls a behavioral state, the male's motivation to continue mating. Okay, so it's been known for quite some time there are exactly four neurons, or the Corazonian neurons, located in what would be the equivalent of the spinal cord for fruit flies. So this is in their ventral nerve cord, and which is a at sort of a, uh, on the lower, I guess, side of the nerve cord of Drosophila. These neurons are silent, but suddenly erupted about seven minutes after the onset of copulation. Uh, so if we draw this out on a time scale, um, and I'm ignoring a lot of, I'm going to ignore a lot of things here, but there's a seven minute interval where sort of the the heat of the moment, let's just say. And then you go out to 20 minutes. So this is a seven minute mark. This is a 20 minute mark. This is the initiation of the behavior. 
what they're saying is that for this part of the behavior, it's very important for there to be this one phase of the behavior. And then it, in the back end, I guess the last 13 minutes, it's less essential for the behavior to continue. And there's this network of neurons, four neurons that are interconnected. And in insects, you tend to be able to find these kind of uh, circuits, but the, it's it becomes active. It bur it's, it's what they call bursty, which means it gives a a pretty s sudden output of the network, and then that output is sort of like a signal to change your behavioral state, or I guess change the motivation for population. So that's the time scale we have. We have these. We have a seven-minute time scale, a twenty-minute time scale, and a thirteen-minute time scale. And it's driven in part by this little network here. So that's that's what they're getting at here. Um, the first thought that comes to a neuroscientist's mind is these four neurons are downstream of the central nervous system, and they're silent for the most part. So they're unlikely to be involved in any complicated computation. They're probably just gatekeepers of the event. So the idea would be that they're this is. These four neurons are not a representation. They're just kind of like a switch. In other words, they don't serve to sort of uh, represent anything. It's just that turn them on, turn them off. You get the signal. You change your behavior. That's the time scale. And that's that's the way, the traditional way of thinking about it. So uh, some upstream neurons must keep track of time and send excitatory inputs to these neurons for the fly to ejaculate, right? And it turns out that that's not true. It turns out that each of these neurons have their own cell intrinsic timer. So once a cell's seven minute timer is up, it fires. The four neurons are recurrently connected, so we have to actually add recurrent connections here. Um, I guess we could just say that they're uh, nearest neighbor recurrent connections. Something like this. So there's feedback. And um, so they have their own intrinsic timer. They're connected to one another. Um, so a cell will also fire if it sees the other neurons fire. So it's like this fire together, wire together aspect where all of them are firing at the same time because they each fire independently and they act collectively. You know, so they all have this sort of threshold of time, not just of activity that's coming in from downstream or upstream. So you could have, for example, something connected into this, right? You could have some connections from the central nervous system, but that's not what he's saying, that these really don't matter. There probably are connections, but they don't function in the way that you might think. And so imagine four agents sitting around a large table, each with their own small seven-minute hourglass. So they're keeping time. Their task is to shout together when seven minutes has elapsed. But no one wants to rely too much on the accuracy of their own hourglass. So this is an error correction mechanism. If you're if the cells are measuring time, they don't, you know, they measure time, but they don't have like a stopwatch. They have to measure time in some way. They don't really have, I guess, you know, uh, an intelligence maybe for measuring time, but they what they do have are like concentrations of molecules that may build up. And you can, if you control the rate of that, you can have like a timer, which happens in some biological systems, like the gene regulatory networks I mentioned. Or you can have this uh, system where you can approximate the time, but then, you know, other agents are able to verify whether that time limit has been reached. So that improves the accuracy because if all the timers are sort of a little bit off, you know, if uh, one goes off and then the other goes off, then you should go off early if you're misaligned in terms of time. So these four neurons sort of error correct for each other. So they're able to maintain this uh, time period pretty tightly. Uh, yeah, so we don't want to rely too much on our own hourglass for accuracy, so we error correct each other. Um, and then you know, this is kind of anthropomorphizing it a bit, but basically the cells reach a consensus in the network. So this is a cell intrinsic timer, and this leads us to internal molecular processes that lead to a burst of electrical activity. So like I said, there's a set of molecular events in the cell 
then implement the timer. And so you can have the expression of different genes in, in the production of proteins, and then when you get to a critical mass of those, over time, it triggers a behavior. So the timer that we're talking about here actually consists of two shorter timers, where the conclusion of the first sets off the second. So the first timer is a fully cell intrinsic five to six minute timer implemented by CAM uh, kinase two molecules. So we can actually augment our time timeline here by putting in like a, a six minute window. All right, so kinases are pretty important in functional uh, biochemistry. Uh, they do a lot of interesting things, but in this case, uh, CAMK2 is actually involved in memory consolidation. So we'll see this in, in another paper. This is a subject of their first paper. Uh, calcium MK, uh, kinase 2 is an ancient molecular structure that can store memory in its phosphorylation state, which is what kinases do, they operate in a phosphorylated and dephosphorylated state, uh, which is it's like a functional uh, difference. Uh, these kinase molecules are phosphorylated on the onset of copulation. So when you have this onset of copulation at the beginning, you have this phosphorylation event. All right. And then you have an accumulation of these molecules uh, over time. With the passage of time, they gradually get dephosphorylated, and that allows the second timer to begin running. So there's this dephosphorylation event where there are a bunch of dephosphorylation events here. And this just changes their functional state. And so this is uh, this is a kind of a, a collection of these molecules. They change their biochemistry, and then that timing of that process leads to this timer. So this is where the second timer begins running. The second timer implements reaching consensus. Although it doesn't strictly need to ex external inputs to work, it is sped up by inputs for other types of these neurons. Uh, the main component of this timer is the gradual conversion of ATP to cyclic AMP. Here, a molecular cascade that follows cyclic AMP production, the cell's memory and potential rises, and this leads to spiking. So there's this biochemical cascade that happens, um, and it leads to this output of the neuron. Normally, it takes 60 to 75 seconds for this timer to lead to the eruption event. So there's actually a lot longer window that we're dealing with which goes out to like 60 to 75 minutes. So I'll just denote that by this sort of extension. And so this could be like a normal process here, but it's shortened in these cells. Um, but this process can be artificially induced by using a light-gated protein that hastens the production of CAMP in the cell. So we can actually speed this process up in the cell. Um, so this is a figure from the paper, 2021 paper showing this network. You have the CAM, cyclic AMP, PDE, the calcium ions that are being released here. You have this, uh, these, these receptors here. And you have all this stuff going on, and there's this release machinery, the other cells, and that's how we're getting our, our coordinated behavior in, this, in the network. There are still a few missing pieces of the puzzle. It's not clear how this timer is initiated or how the first timer sets off the second timer, but the general picture has already emerged with serious implications for the entire field. So we can look at calcium imaging to look at some of these smaller timescales. We can actually even use fMRI to look at like some of the uh, indirect measurements of electrical signaling. But we have short-term memory of elapsed time that is undetectable by these methods. So even calcium imaging doesn't give you some of the aspects of, of short-term memory. here. Um, and so because it is stored within the cell, it doesn't have anything to do with voltage. It doesn't have anything to do with hemodynamics. It really has to do with the molecular world inside the cell. So yeah, this is this is cool. Um, 
The other paper here is this uh, paper. Oh, let me see if this is actually related. Uh, so this is uh, this is the Thornquist paper from 2020, and um, this is uh, calcium and kinase two measures the passage of time to coordinate behavior in motivational state. So this kind of breaks down this whole thing. The highlights here are that the first uh, neuronal interval timer lasting longer than a few seconds. So this is talking about interval timing that's longer than a few seconds. Four male specific neurons measure time during drosophila mating. So these are specific to males and they're they don't serve they're not modulated by any inputs. They do this all autonomously. There's a slow decay of this kinase activity and it delays a motivational switch for six minutes. Electrical activity is required only to report the conclusion of the timer. And so this is where they look at this interval timer that slowly decays, and then it delays sperm transfer and a simultaneous change in the motivation to continue mating. So it, it, it basically mediates that timing of mating. And so, yeah, this kind of goes through, uh, they kind of go through their methods and they talk about some of the evidence that so they look, they have to do some uh, GFP reporting and they show that these uh, neurons are there and then they, you know, kind of talk about the level, they measure the levels of molecules within the uh, cells and they can actually get a sense of the timing of it. So this is a, a phosphorylation process, dephosphorylation process, and it has a, a specific timing and then that happens over a longer time scale when it triggers a behavior. That's basically what they're doing here. This paper here in Journal of Neurochemistry is a little bit different. It talks about uh, calcium chemodulin dependent kinase 2, which is what we were talking about, uh, calcium M kinase 2, and memory destabilization. So this is where they talk about this molecule is important in synapses for uh, consolidating long-term memories. So they actually can uh, remove this molecule and they can destabilize memories. So they can actually erase memories. And there have been a number of papers on this where they've been able to remove memories in this way in mice. And so it's not like just something that we're talking about in the abstract. They're actually able to do experiments on this. So this is a review article on this area. Uh, in this review, we discuss the poorly explored explored role of calcium calmodulin dependent protein kinase 2 in memory maintenance and its influence in memory destabilization. After a brief review on uh, this molecule and memory destabilization, we present critical pieces of evidence suggesting that uh, calcium MK2 activity increases retrieval-induced memory destabilization. So remember in the last papers, we talked about this as like being a counter for a process that triggers, it's triggered at sort of the onset of copulation and then when it runs down, it, it triggers this behavior uh, in a certain way. In this case, what's happening is that this activity uh, can increase retrieval and use memory destabilization. So it works at the synapse to do that, uh, not in, in terms of within the cell. We then proceed to propose two potential molecular pathways to explain the association between this activation and increased memory destabilization. This review will pinpoint gaps in our knowledge, discuss some controversial observations, uh, establishing the basis for new experiments on the role of this molecule memory reconsolidation. Uh, this is of great clinical relevance, but we don't really have the science down yet. So it can, it can actually work in a wide range of substrates and is involved in many aspects of cellular function, such as the regulation of ion channel function, neurotransmitter release, gene transcription, cytoskeletal, organi cytoskeletal organization, and intracellular work, calcium homeostasis, which is what we talked about just now in the other paper. So there's this aspect of calcium homeostasis and what's going on inside the cell. Um, in mammals, four different isoforms of this enzyme are expressed. Uh, the most abundant isoforms in the brain are alpha and beta. Uh, these isoforms are usually associated with each other, creating a holoenzyme composed of 12 subunits organized into two rings. Uh, yeah, 
that. So they talk about the structure, the biochemical structure of it. Um, and then I want to get into the, the aspect where they talk about the function. So um, nonetheless, this molecule has been in, shown to be important for memory extinction. Prolonged and repetitive re-exposure to the conditioned stimulus without the unconditioned stimulus leads to a gradual weakening of the conditioned response. Uh, so this is talking about like uh, uh, reinforcement learning in, in the brain. Um, memory extinction is the learning of new environmental conditions that suppress the previously learned condition response. So this is a, this is goes back to Pavlov and some of the behaviorists where they did these things with uh, conditioning using a conditioned and unconditioned stimulus to look at how you know conditioning works. And then they can extinguish a memory by exposing and getting an organism to learn new environmental conditions that suppress the previously learned ones. And so how does that work? Um, the partial reduction of uh, calcium MK2 as autophosphorylation in heterozygous mutants. So they can create mutants that don't express this properly. This impairs extinction of contextual fear memory. So it interferes with memory if you have a different type of a different type of molecule or not, not enough that's being made. Furthermore, blocking of hippocampal uh, CAMK2 kinase activity impairs memory extinction. Inhibition of the molecular activity by intrahippocampal injection blocks the facilitation of memory extinction. So there are a lot of manipulations you can do to show that there's function here. And so, but this is just at the molecular level. So what is it doing at the behavioral level? Here we propose a different novel and unexplored role for CAMK2 in memory. We will avoid the traditional discussion of it as a learning or memory molecule, in addition to its role in memory extinction. Instead, we will explore a different role for it in memory maintenance, its role in memory destabilization. This memory destabilization, which is not the same as the mass uh, forgetting that we talked about, or catastrophic forgetting, in artificial neural networks. Memory destabilization is an important step of retrieval-induced memory reconsolidation, which means that you're consolidating a memory and you're reconsolidating it. So they talk about memory reconsolidation and you know how that works. Uh, you can have an amnesic effect, which is induced by electroconvulsive shock 24 hours after fear conditioning training. So you deliver us uh, something that's catastrophic to the organism, and they can forget what they learned. They have this amnesic effect. Uh, such amnesic effects could only be achieved if the electroconvulsive shock was presented after re-exposure to the conditioned stimulus. So what happens is that the associative memory uh, between a conditioned stimulus and an unconditioned stimulus was lost. The uh, catastrophic event kind of cut that uh, and interfered with that with that learning. Um, this observation challenged the long prevailing theory that memories once consolidated would no longer be labile or plastic. Um, so this is this kind of goes through talking about memory and consolidation and plasticity. Um, a previously consolidated memory is impaired by pharmacological blocking, which means they use a drug to basically block protein synthesis after the retrieval process, uh, you can imp impair previously consolidated memories because they constantly have to be refreshed. And sometimes they're, you know, recalled and, and things like that. So this is a, a continuous process where this, uh, this system has to be working. So if you, you know, you can impair uh, the system by blocking it with a drug and seeing what happens. Um, so this is basically a graph here, a schematic representation. You have memory retrieval. This is memory reconsolidation. So it's memory retrieval. You have destabilization at the synapse. There's protein degradation. Then when the memory is retrieved, you have restabilization of the memory, and then the memory is maintained. So basically, there's some encoding at the synapse. You retrieve the memory. You destabilize that, that uh, encoding. And then you take it and you operate on it, and then you have to restabilize it to keep the memory together. So I don't know how to describe it behaviorally, but it's like if I remember something, I'm triggering a process in the brain that might 
allow me to forget it if I don't restabilize the memory. You know, maybe I operate on different parts of different memories and I bring them together. But basically, biochemically speaking, it destabilizes and then restabilizes that trace. And then the memory is maintained. So that's why we were interested in reconsolidation, because it reconsolidates a lot of what we had learned. So this is basically talking about the role of calcium MK2 in memory destabilization and and kind of going through that. Um, so this is, you know, this is kind of a cool way of thinking about this. Uh, there's a, a bunch of, there are a bunch of uh, references here where they talk about uh, calcium MK2 activity in different parts of the brain. So in the forebrain, in the amygdala, in the hippocampi, in dorsal hippocampi. And they're all inv involved in different behavioral phenotypes that we can see here. And so, you know, this is a widespread process, but it's this sort of um, process that, that exists at a very short time scale. And it contributes to things at higher time scales. And that's not something that we like detect as a process, right? I mean, we don't really detect brain activity. We don't even detect really muscle activity. It's sort of op in the terms that we've been using in cognition features, that's opaque. This is, I guess, what you would call super opaque. But we can see the effects of it. If something happens to our uh, level of CAMK2 kinase, or CAMK2, we get, um, you know, we, we have effects in terms of memory. So nevertheless, it's it's there and it's affecting what we do. So that that's my discussion of different time scales and, and how those sort of interact and how those produce behaviors. And what we were talking about in the discussion groups, of course, was the connection between those kinds of processes and then conscious processes. So how do they impact conscious processes? What are we conscious of? You know, maybe we don't need things, maybe we need things to be transparent to have them work, you know, in an automatic way. I guess maybe it was transparency that I'm thinking of, maybe not opaqueness. But um, the point is, is that, you know, we have these processes that we don't think about. We have these processes that we're more aware of. And they operate at different time scales. And so we're still kind of putting together a model of that. I'm not really sure where to go from there. But in any case, um, any questions? No questions, but interesting stuff. Yeah. I, uh, I want to know particularly about the memory aspect of biology. It's something I want to do more, but I don't have a lot of background there, so I appreciate this. Um, no questions for me, but I think I'm going to have to kind of shorten myself. So I don't know if there's anything else we were going to talk about or. I don't think I was supposed to present anything else today or any questions about them and stuff. I might leave soon. Okay. Yeah, I don't think uh, I don't think Rishali is going to make it today, but hopefully she can give us an update next week or next Friday. Um, I don't know. If, will, will you be available next weekend, Jesse, or will you be busy with We Robot? <sighs> That's a good question. I may try to do a similar like 10 minute check in. I don't really, I haven't, I don't know exactly what the schedule is for Saturday yet, but I would anticipate a brief check in. Yeah, like uh, at the New York Celebration of Women in Computing, we did a live stream yeah. of like the conference venue. So that might be kind of cool to do. But <laughs> Maybe I can do that on my phone better too, or, you know chunk around my um, laptop with the time. We'll see. Maybe I'll try to make that a little more interactive or, uh, you know, visually worthwhile. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see. <laughs> All right. And then you have, you want people to submit questions for We Robot, And we have something in the Slack in the, uh, I think it's the Google Summer of Code channel. So um, let me show that real quick. So Jesse's collecting questions for we robot. Yeah, you can um, just throw them in in Slack or honestly even in general. I think I'm gonna just make a general announcement for that. But is there any particular stuff that you're it's it's not really really for, well formed right now. 
yeah. but um, I'll put them all in that document later. Um, if there's any particular issues or like questions or technologies in the realm of you know, legal policy or like prosthetics, like that that link in there is from a place to move prosthetics and the legal and ethical issues around sort of like human brain brain computer or human computer types. Uh, Things that would have, would cognitively relate to, um, you know, enhancing or adjusting or modifying and like the legal issues around that. So that's why I put that in there. But um, if there's any like key points, uh, just just like writing them out as bullet points would be helpful even um, in that. So I'll, I'll do a prompt for that later. But yeah. Okay. Well, that sounds great. Um, yeah. Thanks for doing that. And then. <coughs> I assume you'll fill us in on the discussions later. Because, yeah. Sure. yeah. <laughs> All right. Amanda or Morgan, is there anything you wanted to mention before we go? Okay. Yeah, that's great. Um, okay, well, thank you for attending. And... Um, have a good week and uh, talk to you later. Take care. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah.